Welcome to the UCLA Design Media Arts Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series. I am Professor Rebecca Mendez, and I am here to introduce alumna Pinar Yoldas, whose lecture is co-sponsored by UCLA Art Science Center. Pinar Yoldas is a cross-disciplinary artist and researcher based in Durham, North Carolina. Her work develops within biological sciences and digital technologies through architectural installations, kinetic sculpture, sound, video, and drawing, with a focus on post-humanism, econihilism, anthropocene, and feminist technoscience. Pinar is an artist who addresses issues that are central to our times. She is a 21st century explorer who seeks novel and poetic ways to create awareness on different aspects of anthropomorphic, I'm, I'm sorry, that too, <laughs> anthropogenic impact on our planet. From rapid species loss due to global warming to ecosystem disturbances due to plastic pollution, her work produces mind-expanding insights on these mood-spoiling subject matters. As she writes, most environmental problems we are confronted with today share two qualities, inaccessibility and complexity. Pinar believes that through a successful marriage of art and science, such problems can be grasped by the larger public. The good news here is that she is succeeding. She has been listened to. She is the 2015 John Simon Guggenheim Fellow in the Fine Arts and the 2016 Future Emerging Arts and Te Technology Award recipient. Her solo shows, I mean, her accolades are extensive. I'm just gonna mention a few. Her solo shows include Alter Evolution, Ekavart Istanbul, An Ecosystem of Excess, Ernst Sharing Project Space in Berlin. Her group exhibitions include Thing World, Namok National Art Museum of Beijing, 2014, Transmediale Festival in Berlin, 2014, Dear und Menschen, I know I'm completely bastardizing some of these names, sorry. Ostwald Dortmund, 2014. Polytech Museum Moscow, Exo Evolution at uh, ZKM, 2015. And the 14th Istanbul Biennale, 2015. Oh, and Taiwan National Museum Fine Arts, 2016. I am going to perhaps not talk so much about the residencies because I have a litany of them. She's definitely been accepted into so many and awarded with so many residencies. But her work has been featured in Arte TV, Die Welt, The, Creator, the Creator's Project, Art 21 Blog, The Spiegel, Vogue Turkey, and Artlink BioArt Issue, to name just a few. Pinar is a PhD candidate at Duke University at the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and Media Arts and Sciences. She holds, bachelor, uh, she holds a Bachelor's of Architecture from Middle East Technical University, a Master's of Arts from Bilgi University, and a Master's of Science from Istanbul Technical University. On top of that, she graduated, of course, with honors, with all the happiest, and you have all the faculty adoring her, because she graduated in, 20, in, in uh, 2008 with a Master's of Fine Art from the University of California, Los Angeles, Design Media Arts. Yay, 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 yay of course. <laughs> Where she was uh, working also at the Art Science Center and the UCLA Game Lab. Her book, An Ecosystem of Excess, was published by Argo Books in 2014. She holds a bronze medal in organic chemistry in the Turkish National Science Olympics in 1997. <laughs> and she had her first solo exhibition when she was five. We are in the presence of an extraordinary human being that I am not only honored, but the happiest to introduce. Here is Pinar. Hi everyone. Um, it's it's very difficult not to get too excited about this giving this talk here uh, at 
DMA at EDA, where we pulled all-nighters in Solling Lark uh, quite many times. And I'm um, really um, so happy to see most of you. I'm not going to list all the names right now, but um, thank you so much for coming, old friends, and hi, new friends. So um, I decided to title my talk, Untitled, Art in the Age of Synthetic Biology, Breast Implants, Turbo Capitalism, Pelagic Plastics, Endocrine Disruptors, Online Dating, Habitat Loss, Serotonin Uptake Inhibitors, the Connectome, High Fructose Corn Syrup, CO2 Emissions, Big Data, Small World, Anti-Aging, Oil Spill, Air Pollution, Nanomedicine, Bioaccumulation, NASDAQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I thought, maybe I should call it simply Future is Broken, 10 Attempts to Fix It with Art and Design. <laughs> then I decided, hmm, maybe I should call it Critical Creatures, because I uh, basically design a lot of organisms, even hypothetically, uh, 15 organisms to heal your cognitive dissonance. But the final title will be Speculative Biology, because this is also the title of my dissertation at Duke, so I'll just stick with this today. But um, the collection of works that I'm going to show include some organisms, which I call critical creatures, and um, some artworks, um, interactive or kinetic sculptures, architectural, you'll decide, uh, all of which have to do with one concept, the Anthropocene. So I'm just assuming that most people here in this room are familiar with this wor word, but are you, actually? Yeah, well, um, I'll just give some info, why not? Uh, the picture <laughs> is, it's an, it's, I think, I don't know if some people recognize him, but he's a famous wrestler saving a dolphin that beached out. And um, the term Anthropocene actually starts with an uh, atmospheric chemist, Nobel Prize winner, uh, John Crutzen. And uh, I think around the millennium, or maybe 2006, um, the geologists uh, got together to define this new ep epoch uh, where uh, of all the forces on the face of the planet, the impact of the mankind became the most noticeable and um, the most uh, impactful, yeah. And um, they decided that the Anthropocene kind of starts with the invention of the steam engine and also the, invent, uh, the starting of industrialization. So now this has become almost a buzzword to indicate the negative impact of uh, humans on uh, life's ecosystems, Earth's ecosystems. So um, the first project I'm going to talk about uh, starts at the seat. Uh, this is our seat at the bottom of the ocean. And this is actually an image that was taken around four or five kilometers deep down the ocean at the Benthic area. Benthic is the name given to that part of the ocean where almost 60% of plastic pollution sinks, and uh, including this very plastic chair. And this is our seat um, waiting for us in the midst of a terrifyingly beautiful ocean storm of plank plankton uh, mixed with plastic particles. So I've been sitting in this chair for a while, and um, that's how I actually decided to work on an ecosystem of excess. And I have to say that also, given the context of this talk, uh, the idea I had while I was here at DMA, while I was living in Los Angeles. Uh, an ecosystem of, of access uh, is a collection of various taxa from an ecosystem that emerges in the plastic ocean. And um, let's first talk about the idea of excess. It's not a bad word. It actually comes from the natural world. In Darwin's theory of sexual selection, for instance, we see how animal beauty is excessive. Uh, animal art is excessive to the point that it becomes a threat for the animal. And, uh, but there's also excessive consumption. So um, this is one of my favorite thinkers, Elizabeth Grosch, who makes this connection between Darwin's uh, notion of excess in the nature and our notion of art 
as humans. So she claims that the notion of art and aesthetics that we have, uh, that us humans have, come from the animal world, the excesses of the animal world. So um, another concept that I use uh, in an ecosystem of excess is this notion of extreme environments. Uh, and I'll just read the biological definition here, actually. Extreme environments are niches or biotas where conditions of life are challenging for a multitude of life forms. Examples of extreme environments can be outer space, other planets, geographical poles, very dry deserts, volcanoes, deep ocean trenches, and so on, where environmental parameters such as radiation, extreme temperatures, acidity, or pressure, pressure do not allow life to flourish. So, but again, back to the notion of Anthropocene, Today, we live among man-made and extreme environments. So these are environments that have been made by, by us, such as a river of nickel, a mountain of discarded monitors somewhere in China, an oil spill uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico, or the open ocean. And um, there's another concept that I borrow from biology, extremophiles. And these are basically creatures that can survive in really harsh environments. For instance, acidophiles would love highly acidic environments. Alkalophiles love the opposite. Hypothermophiles love really extreme heat. And uh, I just added this, plastophiles love plastics. Osmophiles like oxygenated environments. They love outer spaces, zero fields, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is the man-made extreme environment I chose for my plastophiles. And it's also known as North Pacific Subtropical Gyre. Uh, let's see if this animation will play. Yeah, so um, colloquially known as Pacific Trash Vortex, and I'm again assuming that most of us in this room would be familiar with this uh, Pacific Trash Vortex. Uh, this is the, this floating nexus of plastic gyre in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And um, the size of the gyre is unknown. Some say it's like uh, twice the size of France or Texas, et cetera. And uh, some say it's as big as like the state itself. Uh, what we know is that it's expanding. And normally, um, plastic waste that gathers in the ocean comes, 80% uh, of it comes from the land. And it takes about six years for plastic to, you know, uh, complete this journey uh, to the trash vortex. And throughout this journey, there are all kinds of different processes that happen, such as photodegradation, where plastic particle, uh, plastic, uh, you know, leftovers, uh, plastic waste uh, kind of crumbles and turns into microplastics, like ri really tiny particles. In this sense, Pacific Trash Vortex is a monument of plastic waste built by all the nations around the um, Pacific Ocean. It's almost like a conscious, sublime, uh, you know, floating um, dynamic sculpture. Um, so when I found out about this, again, I was here in LA, right? And uh, I started doing research about the origins of plastics. And this is um, uh, from, I think, the Life magazine from 50s, where we're celebrating the throwaway living. I don't know if you can read this. It takes about 40 hours uh, to clean. So the premise is that uh, by using disposable plastics, disposable goods, a regular housewife could save up to 40 hours on house chores, which she could then spend on buying new stuff, probably. And um, my question to you is, can you see, there are like three people in the picture, can you see the child? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's, it's a she, right? And her face is obscured, ironically obscured by one of these, you know, uh, flying disposable uh, plastics. Our future, the future, which is she there, has been kind of obs obscured. And within, um, from 50s to now, within 60 years, uh, oh, of course, this one, this is like literally a man monument to nylon. So when nylon was first introduced, uh, there, there was this craze and like um, women were going crazy about this and like they were uh, forming long lines uh, in front of shops that sold nylon. So here's a literal monument to that. 
And um, this is again uh, a spread from House Beautiful magazine. You'll have a greater chance to be yourself than any people in the history of civilization. So within 60, 65 years, we've accomplished this. We have become more of ourselves than anyone else in the history of civilization. So uh, back to the vortex. Um, in the vortex, there are more than 45 uh, pieces of plastics uh, per plankton. I, actually, these numbers are from 2013, so this must be much more than that now. And uh, this is an image by Chris Jordan. And I'm sure you've seen this image before. And Chris Jordan is now working on a documentary called Midway, where he's, um, I want to show you an ex excerpt, but I'm stuck in these two screens, can't find my cursor. Where is my cursor? Okay. All right, I'll just talk about it. Um, so he goes out to this uh, uh, island, which is the only island in the middle of Pacific Trash Vortex, and basically documents the process of uh, dying and um, uh, in the Lazen Albatross. And um, what happens is um, the adult birds mostly survive, uh, not this one obviously, but uh, the chicks uh, can't really survive uh, being fed plastics by their mother. But Aves, birds, is not the only sentient being suffering this newly configured uh, pelagic death. So I'll show you this one. Um, Satisha whales, despite their large body size, uh, they're also affected by this. So in this video, we are seeing a baby sperm whale whose uh, digestive tract had been um, clogged with, uh, I think, 18 kilograms of plastics. We'll see this at the end of the movie. And um, this is very interesting to me because this is a very, it's like where nature meets culture in the digestive tracts of these organisms, the very moment of secretion of digestive enzymes to decompose plastic, basically, um, is nature's humble eff effort to unite itself with our culture. And um, some other images of negative sublime. This is from the uh, BP oil. Uh, spill polluted inside and outside. Uh, more images from the oil spill. Because I love looking at these images, I want to show you some. And again, an oil spill image and another one. So um, this image, I found these images and I thought this was very interesting because here, it's not about death, but it's about the war between these two polymers, keratin versus uh, high-density polyethylene. And actually, here we see that life adopts, life wins. Life always wins. And um, at a place like Pacific Trash Vortex, we've invented a pelagic death. It's invisible to us. It's a distant death. And uh, this is one of the uh, main characters uh, involved in, in the ecosystem of excess, Captain Charles Moore. And I was watching uh, interviews with him, and I found this one where he's holding a sample from the Pacific Trash Vortex, and he goes, uh, the ocean has turned into a soup. This is the, this is the soup. And then at that moment, I, was, I started thinking about the primordial soup theory and how life started in our... Um, oceans, ancient oceans for a billion years ago. And um, I was like, what if life started now in today's oceans in our contemporary primordial soup of plastics? I put colors just to kind of like wake you up if you're feeling really sad at this point. Um, and after this question, I challenged myself with the design of an ecosystem because I thought, well, Designing an ecosystem is much more difficult than designing a website, which I was used to designing, right? And it's much more difficult and challenging than designing a lemon squeezer or a chair. And uh, the world has enough designer chairs anyways. And uh, the time of Fanny Rashid, who loves plastics, is over. I mean, I personally like Philip Stark, but I thought, yes, we have to start thinking about designing ecosystems. 
And uh, back to the soup, um, now I'm gonna show you some images from the ecosystem installation. Um, this is basically um, a sample and um, here I was inspired by this book called uh, Plastic, a Toxic Love Story. And um, in the book there is a chapter where uh, the writer is talking about every single thing she touches uh, from the moment she wakes up uh, till the moment she goes to her car. So this, these inclu include alarm clock, mattress, heating pad, eyeglasses, toilet seat, toothbrush, toothpaste, tube and cap, wallpaper, etc., etc. So we have like samples of this in the soup. And let's see if this one plays. Um, then what this soup actually conveys is that there is no point in our daily lives where we don't interact with plastics. It's become the building block of our modern or contemporary lifestyles. So um, then the soup was in the exhibition for many, many months and um, actually two and a half months and then some bacteria grew in it. And we took samples and I was collaborating with a, a microbiology lab led by Dr. Regina Henge and she created these beautiful images of the bacteria that uh, proliferated in the soup. But in fact, the bacteria I talk about in this exhibition is called the plastosphere bacteria. And um, this is real bacteria that, uh, that had been found, uh, that had been observed in the Pacific trash vortex. And uh, when I was working on the project the same summer, um, Dr. Linda Amaral Zettler and her colleagues published this uh, paper called Life in the Plastosphere. And um, they basically, uh, in their paper, they say that we unveiled a diverse microbial community of heterotrophs, autotrophs, predators, and symbionts, a community we refer to as the plastosphere. So this is a moment where plastosphere is officially defined by scientists as a new ecosystem. And uh, I was, you know, corresponding with them and they sent me SEM images of their findings and we had some conversations with them which has been published uh, in, in, the, in an ecosystem of excess book. What I had to do was, for, of course, I was very happy about this because as an ecosystem designer and a beginner ecosystem designer, all I had to do was like, okay, now I can extrapolate from bacteria. What else is, you know, involved in this ecosystem? So I uh, started uh, looking at insects and crustacea, and I um, came up, uh, I uh, found this paper, uh, which was published by a very young scientist, Miriam Goldstein, and in her paper, um, she basically shows that uh, in the Pacific trash vortex, due to the uh, increase of microplastics, uh, the concentration of microplastics in the water, the number of aquatic insects uh, is also increasing. Normally, uh, pelagic insects or aquatic insects don't prefer the open ocean because they can't, their, they can't lay their eggs, which is called oviposition. But she shows that uh, after the introduc introduction of microplastics uh, in the open ocean, now we see more insects. So I actually um, studied aquatic insects and um, in the exhibition there's a whole section where you see these insects that lay uh, these eggs or make these kind of shells and their eggs have like a lot of plastic content so they, they are very crucial for the ecosystem. And then the next step in the uh, ecosystem of excess was the Nurdle Beach and uh, Nurdles, it's Nurdle is the colloquial name given to pre-production plastic pellets and they are the currency of the plastic industry. And um, again, in 2000, 15, it was estimated that over 150 billion kilograms of nurdles uh, are manufactured and shipped. And um, what happens is uh, they easily escape the corporate borders of these uh, manufacturing facilities and they end up in our beaches. So they are the number one beach contaminants. And um, ironically, they're called mermaid's tears because of their kind of translucent appearance. But I was thinking, okay, are these tears, tears of joy or tears of sorrow? And um, I, uh, you know, have 
in, in our ecosystem, we have uh, some reptilia and unknown taxa that lives in the, in the speech. And um, please meet uh, Kelonia globus aerostaticus, Pacific balloon turtle. And um, again, while I was doing research on plastic pollution, I found another paper, which was a very weird paper, to be honest, because this paper compared the uh, looked at the behavior of a hungry marine turtle um, when uh, faced with clear plastics versus colored plastics, which primarily came from balloons. Again, uh, balloon pollution is kind of like a local problem that we have in California. And um, apparently, the paper shows that um, marine turtles prefer colored plastics, balloons, to clear plastics. So I was like, this is, this is really you know, um, sad, but at the same time ridiculous. So Pacific balloon turtle, after eating um, balloons for eons, develops an inflatable plastic bag. And um, this serves as a, like a survival advantage because the sea levels are rising and the turtle has to maybe swim across longer distances and it can lay on its back. Uh, but it could also become a fitness indicator. Uh, these are uh, PVC worms. It's like a symbiotic relationship. And um, these are transchromic eggs of a benthic reptile. Again, if you remember the chair in the beginning of uh, this presentation, uh, the benthic area is really rich uh, in plastic content. So this reptile chooses to lay its eggs there. But uh, over time, I hope we can see the color change here in this movie too. Over time, um, the eggs like uh, grow, uh, change their density, and they like float to the beach, and uh, they acquire a white color. So um, the next species in the ecosystem of excess is uh, birds, marine birds, and uh, we're all familiar with this, especially here at Design Media Arts. And um, I was looking at, remember Chris Jordan's image. Uh, the contents of a dead marine bird, the contents in the digestive tract of a dead marine bird. And uh, sadly, 30% of this comes from bottle caps because bottle caps is this one thing that we cannot recycle. Here I have one, which doesn't have a color. And I was like, well, just like turtles that eat plastic balloons for eons, these birds, you know, eat, uh, choose to eat um, plastic bottle caps for eons. It's their favorite food. And I was thinking about flamingos that acquire their beautiful, uh, almost fluorescent orange color from the krill that they eat. And um, in an ecosystem of excess, we have uh, pigmentation that comes from these corporate colors. So we have birds that express Coca-Cola red. We have birds that express Evian pink. We have birds that express the sunny blue or Sprite green or Fanta orange. And um, this is actually a collection that's kind of local. These are bottle caps from China, so they have their own local birds, with kind of Chinese corporate colors. And um, yeah, the last part and the most crucial part in the ecosystem of excess is organs for sensing and metabolizing plastics. Because when you challenge yourself with the design of an ecosystem, you really need to think about how energy is circulating in the system. Where is the food? How do we find it? How do we break it down so that we make ATP? And uh, the first organs that I had to think about were uh, plastoceptors. So plastoception is the sense by which an organism perceives plastics. So it's just like the eye is an organ that's designed to like receive photons and then is detect light, the spectrum of light. Plastoceptors detect different types of uh, polymer chains, basically. And in fact, we have examples of this uh, in the industry. And P plastoceptor uh, gets, takes its name from its appearance that looks, resembles a pea, but at the same time, uh, this plastoceptor is really good at detecting polypropylene, which is the number two most common uh, you know, uh, plastic uh, that we use, uh, and that's also found in the ocean. And uh, the plastoception follows principles of quantum biomechanics, uh, 
And uh, this is an e-plasoceptor, uh, another sensory organ. And these are the most common, actually, because the molecule that they sense is the most common plastics that's around us. It's uh, polyethylene. And here are some anatomical drawings of how these um, organs work. Um, this is stomaximus. It's a ma maximized stomach. And <coughs> each mini ventricle in this organ hosts bacteria specializing um, in breaking down a particular kind of plastic. So I was inspired by how, you know, guts in nature normally work. And uh, this poly polychambered digestive organ is capable of metabolizing a different vari a variety, a huge variety of plastics, including high and low density polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, polyurethane, polyethylene, terephthalate, acry acrylonitrile, betadine, citrate, and vinyl. So you see all these like tiny little vesicles, and each of these uh, can host different types of bacteria. And uh, the next organ in an ecosystem of excess is, uh, these are anatomical drawings, petronephros. Again, uh, this is a kidney for the plastivore, and plastivores are just like carnivores eat uh, meat, and herbivores prefer uh, herbs, plants. Um, plastivores eat a lot of plastic, so petronephros is a necessity for them because it filters out really obnoxious stuff such as bisphenol, or uh, POPs, persistent organic pollutants, or uh, phthalates, and so on. So the organ basically forms tumors and wraps them in like these uh, little uh, packets and then releases it. And the last uh, organ system in an ecosystem is a digestive system, a complete digestive system for marine birds. And um, it's taxing and difficult for birds uh, to crumble and um, granulate hard plastics. So this system has um, a specialized gizzard, for instance, a reinforced proventriculus and such to help the bird deal with, uh, you know, the um, consistency of plastics. And this is the drawing. So these are some exhibition, uh, some images from different types, different installations, because I've been installing this work in different venues, it's become a traveling exhibition. Um, let's see if this one plays. In the back, we have kind of a symbolic uh, data visualization of like the number of birds affected by plastics or sea mammals uh, together with the top 10 uh, plastic manufacturers and uh, top 10 countries that uh, dispose plastics in the ocean. So you get all this information uh, together with the anatomical drawings like uh, of an ecosystem of excess. And um, this is a workshop where we're designing new organs for the ecosystem, so it's, it's a growing ecosystem basically. And I'll end with this, uh, end this project with this quote by Rachel Carson, who is one of the first um, scientists and environmentalists, uh, again from 50s. She wrote this beautiful book called uh, The Silent Spring, 1962. Why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons? Yeah. Now, um, I'm looking at the time, and I actually thought that I should be talking about an ecosystem of excess heavily because it kind of gives an idea of where, what I'm trying to do with my work, including organs and organs and design. But since we're in the ocean, let's maybe talk about saltwater heart as well. This was um, a recent project that I built, uh, that I designed and helped build for the Istanbul Biennial last summer. And um, again, I was, you know, reading a lot about the ocean currents and the movement in our oceans and like life in the oceans, etc. And this is an article uh, by, uh, from New Scientist 1982 uh, stating that the Bosphorus uh, is one of the most polluted straits uh, uh, known to mankind. And Bosphorus basically is um, this, you see, you, you see the map over there. Um, it's the strait that divides Asia from Europe. And it's the strait that made Istanbul Istanbul, basically. 
but it's very, very polluted. And um, since the biennial steam was salt water, um, what was it, a new experiment on thought forms, something like that, I thought, uh, okay, well, this is a perfect opportunity for me to talk about the fact that Turkey didn't do anything since 1982 about Bosphorus. And um, then I found out about, then I was doing research on thermohaline circulation, which is basically the fact that there are different types of, uh, there are these different types of currents in the ocean and uh, based on differences in salinity and temperature, there are these pumps almost that create circulation in our oceans. And I saw a resemblance or a similarity between the circulatory systems that we have and uh, the thermohaline circulation in our oceans. And I basically wanted to build um, a heart on a boat because this was my venue. And um, I designed a system which uh, pumps water from the Bosphorus and it's suspended, it's, it's an externalized circulatory system and it's suspended with these um, steel uh, kind of skeleton and on top of the skeleton we have um, pipes. So this is a skeleton after we built it. It was actually very difficult to build this, and, but it looks nice. And um, then we had these um, kind of pipes and motors that were pumping uh, water from the Bosphorus and the water was circulating in the system. So we basically built an architecture, this architectural space on top of this boat where you could see the water coming from the Bosphorus. But um, the main thing about the project was basically um, the size of the boat was 45 meters, which is the size of, uh, of a blue whale almost. And we made these pumps stop and beat at the rhythm of a whale heart. And um, so when you're in the space, the water is circulating around you, but every now and then, I mean every now and then, meaning at the rhythm of the swell heart, it'll stop and start again. So the architectural space becomes very dynamic and it turns into a space to contemplate about the oceans, the sea mammals with the biggest heart and uh, what's happening in the Bosphorus, yeah. This is uh, saltwater heart on a dark and stormy day. So now um, I'm going to switch gears a little. Uh, this, the project, this project I want to talk about is um, a creature only, and I actually brought it with me. So speaking of movement, I thought I should also talk about pool's fall because this is a creature uh, that doesn't move that much. So um, I could pass it around, but maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> maybe you can come and like see it after the talk if you want to. But um, Fool's Fall is uh, an organism which is a minimized chicken. So again, um, I was read interested in movement and the idea of movement in organisms. And um, I was reading about Daniel Wolpert's claim on why we evolved brains. According to him, the reason any organism would have a centralized nervous system is because uh, they need to navigate a highly complex system. And then he gives the example of a sea slug, which starts its life as an animal uh, swimming around to find the perfect spot to settle. And uh, once the animal settles on this rock or whatever, it's uh, where it'll spend the rest of its life, uh, the first thing it does is to eat its prey. And then um, Daniel Wolpert likens this uh, to the position of an academic when he or she gets a tenure track. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so, he basically says that when there is no need for movement, there is no need for a brain. And uh, basically the brain is the unit that makes the connections between the perceptual world and the action world of the animal. And uh, all sensory organs and you know, um, limbs, etc., 
that's connected to this are just there to help this process, right? And um, then I was thinking about movement and its connection to the organism's or the animal's health. Lack of movement uh, causes a long list of um, physical and psychological problems, both in humans and non-human animals. Moreover, um, there is a fundamental connection between movement and positive emotions, or lack of movement and lack of posi positive emotions. So um, it's no surprise that constraining movement is a very effective and ruthless way of punishment, which we've found out very early on in our civilization. And imprisonment, for instance, is nothing but controlling uh, one's physical and psychological well-being by restricting movement. Um, so having brains actually comes at a high cost if you're not moving, if you're not able to move. And um, then I was like looking at this one group of organisms, Gallus domesticus, and uh, this animal is highly affected by lack of movement um, because of the way um, food industry treats them. Let's see this movie, I mean, I'm, I was again thinking about, you know, the fact that like I go to the grocery store and there's this like label cage-free chicken and I'm like, aren't they supposed to be cage-free anyways? And then I was watching a lot of documentaries. Again, the roots of this idea had been planted in my brain while I was at UCLA. And um, I looked at a lot of videos like this and read about this, etc. And here again, you can see that because the animals spend all of their life in these confined spaces, their wings go through atrophy, they lose their wings, and they grow too fast, uh, too quickly, they lose their legs, they can't walk. So it's, it's just a miserable condition to be. It's designed suffering, basically. And uh, I thought, well, maybe with a simple alternation of the carnal layout of this animal, uh, we can move some organs around and um, cancel those that we don't need. So this is, you know, the traditional chicken with all the organs and systems that had been given to it by Mother Nature. And uh, there are all these parts that are there because the animal has to move and has to uh, look for food. And this is fool's fall, which I'm holding in my hand. And here, all the parts that don't really serve the purpose of, let's say, making eggs uh, are canceled out. So this is a suffering-free solution. And um, it's a vastly diminished animal. There's only circulatory, reproductive, and integumentary systems left. I wanted to leave uh, feathers because it's nicer that way. And um, it's a cruelty-free environment. You can have this in your kitchen. You can have two of them. The egg cycle is about 28 hours. You can get one egg in 28 hours. Um, there's a nutrient input. You can add omega-3, whatever you want, to enrich your egg. You can also like play with the color of the egg or have different types of feathers. I'm actually doing like designer fool's fall now with um, iridescent feathers. And this is how the org uh, animal looks like on a display. Uh, on the, in the exhibition setup, and let's play this video. The egg will come. Oh, yeah. So the nutrients go in, uh, and then the egg will come on a daily basis. And to sum up, it's basically an ovarian tribute to modernism because its form follows function. Now, um, I'll have to speed up a little and I'll put full spall here. I hope it doesn't fall. Um, next project is Archipelago. I'm gonna actually maybe not talk about this one because uh, there's another project I wanna talk about. And the, the, again, the idea I had in uh, Casey's class. So I'll skip Archipelago. Simply, you can, you know, um, this was again a recent project that I installed last year. Uh, about protein structures and how proteins are these nanomachines that have different, you know, rotations and like uh, linear movement, etc. That the 
movements of the, again, about movements, uh, proteins are kind of limited. They're based on limited vocabulary. And I designed, um, I was commissioned to build something in the atrium of a science center titled Rudolf Firkov Center. And Rudolf Firkov, he actually discovered the first proteins. And um, this is also an outreach center where there are a lot of kids coming in. So I designed these colorful, you know, pedestals that were inspired by the crystalline structures of proteins. But inside them, I had um, moving structures. Let's see. Uh, moving sculptures, sorry. Kinetic sculptures that were kind of mimicking or alluding to the proteins and um, protein-based structures. At night, uh, the sculptural objects were glowing because poor scientists, they, just like us designers, pull all-nighters and they're like leaving the building through this atrium. I was like, why not give them some hope and some magic? So <laughs> I had this iridescent bubbles for them. And um, let's see. Um, the sculptures were, uh, as I said, like there were some uh, sculptures that re uh, represented uh, 20 amino, amino acids and some sculptures that represented uh, certain, you know, folding structures in the proteins. And uh, yeah, all right. Um, so I'm really running out of time. So this is a project that I showed for my, um, MFA exhibition here at DMA. Um, very fast. It's designer genitalia. And um, the first organ in the series is called a uh, creature in the series. These, these are one of the critical creatures I was talking about earlier. Uh, it's a super mammal. It's quite an excessive creature with a lot of breasts. And I was super happy about this creature when I first designed it. It's one of my very first creatures, actually. But then I realized that my ancestors had done it like many, many centuries ago, together with Hans Balmer, just like last century. So I was like, all right, there's nothing new under the sun, move on. And then I designed Polyfoly, which follows the similar principle. And it's basically a lot of uh, male uh, reproductive organs, penises, and there's a circular layout and a linear layout. And this is actually an organ organ farm where like they're tiny pieces they're gonna grow and um, polyfoly doesn't have a central nervous system it's only acting on like certain impulses and the final one was neolabium and I was thinking about um, making the female uh, sex organ even more visible that it becomes so visible that it, uh, the female sexuality cannot be hidden and uh, let's see I have a video. But then it turned out to be not that cool. So um, the, the one innovative thing about this organ is you can, the, all of these are plug and play, so you could like unplug them and put a female organ on a male body, et cetera, et cetera. So I was experimenting with that a lot. And this is the organ farm for uh, Neolabium. Yeah, maybe I'll just show them. Uh, show like 10 seconds of them in motion. Oh. Are you controlling the sound? This is not that important, but there is one where I need the sound for sure. Okay. Um, which one are you? Just keep talking and I'll okay. mess around a little more. Okay. All right. After this one? After this one. The next one's coming. Okay. It's almost over. Yeah, so um, the video also shows like different parts of uh, neolabium, for instance, there is labium minora, labium majora, but there is labia synthetica, which are these like um, extra um, tissues with more nerve endings on them. Oh, you need to do that. All right. Um. Oh, okay, now it's working. All right.
we don't need to see that because I did all of this, everything about this movie. So, okay, this is the project I want to talk about. Um, yeah, we were, I think it was 2008, we were designing uh, a Rube Goldber Goldbergian voting machine here in Casey's class. And um, we were 10 people, right? And each of us designed a different component of this voting machine. So depending on the input, um, our little components would do something and then like pass the signal to the next person's uh, component, etc., etc. And uh, mine was titled Scream a Homage to Edward Munch and All the Dead Raccoons. So um, this is basically the input that uh, I received from the class. And I was like, yes, Moomp scream. And I uh, basically built a raccoon skull that was screaming uh, every time a Republican voted for the Republicans. And the idea was that like, if there were more votes for for the Republicans, the raccoon would scream longer, etc. I couldn't really like figure out that part, but um, I was proud of this. And um, I wanted to keep working on this, basically. And uh, 2008, 2012, five years later, Five years later, my tiny raccoon skull found itself uh, more friends. It made more friends. And I built a very loud chamber orchestra of endangered, endangered species. Um, again, the core idea was that um, there are a bunch of skulls and that are, they are screaming at the audience. But this time, I wanted to make a concert and I wanted the skulls not to just scream, and it was me screaming basically in the previous version. I wanted them to scream through their own voices, and I also wanted them to sonify uh, CO2 emission data. So um, I picked um, top 15 uh, species that are uh, whose habitats are. Uh, who are experiencing habitat loss because of anthropogenic impact. And um, I basically had a polar bear, I had a killer whale, I had a Chinese alligator, an African lion, an Amazon river dolphin. And um, I, we found, uh, I collaborated with an ecologist who uh, supplied us with information on the habitat loss and I uh, collaborated with a composer from Duke Music School um, who helped me sonify and who helped me composite um, vocalizations of these animals uh, on top of the sonification. Because when we first did the sonification of CO2 emissions, it was basically just like <laughs> And there was no emotional anything to it. It was just like noise. And um, we wanted to have like a crescendo. We wanted each animal to have a voice, etc. So uh, I'm going to show the video, and I'm going to end the lecture after this. Um, maybe I'll skip because it's probably four minutes. Um, but we're taking, we're looking at CO2 emissions data from 2000, uh, sorry, 1978 to 2012. <laughs> And um, there are three acts in the concert. And the first one um, is about CO2. The second one is about water pollution. And the third one is about habitat loss. So the claim was that if we could take this information from science or this numeric information that doesn't have an affective value or affective presence and turn it into a multimodal experience, perhaps 
we can have a, a, a larger impact on the audience and we can create longer lasting memories. Sorry, I had to like skip and it's hard to get the uh, idea because we had a circular sound system where sound was localized, so it wasn't coming from two speakers, but we had 15 speakers and sound was traveling around the uh, audience, so, but you get an idea. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to like end the lecture here. Uh, this is the project that I'm working on this year, Distilling the Sky. I won't talk much about it, but if anybody wants to collaborate with me, I need collaborators <laughs> and designers and, you know, 3D modeling people. I'm here after the lecture. And, um, yeah, you can find more information here. Yes, this is it. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Pinar. That was that was amazing, and um, we're opening for questions. So, if you have any questions, you can please join us. There. What are your questions? Hi, Pinar. I I graduated from uh, Design Me Arts in 2008. I remember fondly your graduate level project. Um, it's really fascinating to see all this. Um, as you look back at your time here at UCLA. Uh, when you did your MFA, um, what threads and learnings you took from here and the projects that you did that you've taken now to your current projects? Thank you. Was that a question? Okay. <laughs> what is the question? 
The question is, uh, like, for example, your speculative biologies, what yeah. did you learn from that that informs you in the, the work that you're currently doing, um, or, or from, from the, the evolution, so to say? Uh, compared to the, the, my moments here at DMA? Well, I mean, I have to say that DMA has been, like, very influential on my work, as you can see. And, of course, I kind of, you know, uh, curated the project so that it resonates with this crowd, too. There are many more, but um, I wasn't defining myself as a media artist before DMA. So I came to DMA thinking that I'm a designer, and I left here as a media artist. So, and I'll leave it there. What are your other questions? Well, so to follow up on that, what would be your, what do you think is the important distinction between the, 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 what the, the demands that are put on somebody who would define themselves as a designer versus somebody who would define themselves as a media artist? Yeah. Tr because obviously your projects, I missed the beginning of the lecture, but the projects yeah. I saw clearly, you can see that there's um, they're balancing somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. Um, so this is an interesting distinction, artist designer, right? And uh, the territory l which I belong to, or this field, uh, some call it design fiction, for instance, or what else? What is the other speculative fiction, right? And uh, there's this whole school uh, by Fiona Dune and Anthony Rabe Raby, and they have this, they published this book called The Speculative, for instance, like recently from MIT Press. And for, they, they say, and they on, like, you know, highlight this, they're like, we're designers, we're not artists. Like, we make design work, and we want to change the world with design, right? And I have nothing to say against that, but I also feel like, you know, making that separation is not that useful, actually. The, re the, the reason they make the separation is that they think that art can be anything, which is true, yes. And uh, they claim that if you, you know, um, label yourself as a designer, or if you have the hashtag designer or whatever, you know, um, then people will take you more seriously because Art can be anything, but design is about solutions, etc. So, I am like a big uh, believer in the transformative power of art, and I want to, you know, kind of like uh, own that label as an artist. I, I, I don't think that, you know, um, I need to call myself an architect because I'm an architect by training, or a designer to, to um, what, how to say this, like, for my work to have an impact on the world. I think art in and of itself is powerful enough to change the way we think. To ch first, to change the way we, we feel about things, right? Because I have all this theory about, like, how it starts with, like, perception and its emotions and then it's, like, thoughts comes from neuroscience. So art is basically, uh, you can think about art as uh, engineering the human sensorium or engineering like the human emotion or engineering affect, right? And I can't think of like anything stronger than that. So I'm like, yeah, I'll call myself artist. And I, it also gives me like more room to experiment. Like it doesn't have to be designed all the time, right? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm interested, you showed a few papers, and I'm interested in like scientific papers. How do you collaborate with, or, or do you collaborate, or do you just take inspiration from the scientists, or how does this work? Is it like also fruitful for them, or like? Well, is it fruitful for them? I think so. Um, yes, I collaborate with scientists, and actually, uh, after I left DMA, I was doing um, a lot of design work for a year or two while figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. 
And uh, then I went to Duke University as an artist in residence in the neuroscience lab. So that was my very first like true collaboration. And I was planted in this lab and I had to go there everywhere and uh, every day and I, I had to join their lab meetings, etc. cetera. So um, that's one way I, you know, like bring science to my work by learning it, right? And by being in close contact with scientists. And ever since I've had more labs and more collaborations like that. Another way is of course, like I'm a researcher. So when I was doing research on uh, plastic pollution, I read a lot about plastics. First, I read all the popular science books and all, all the you know, popular books about plastics, etc. And then I was like um, finding things on Google Scholar. I was asking friends. I was meeting people from the environmental sciences at Duke, asking them about what they know, blah, blah. So that took me to these papers and to these people who are at the forefront of this kind of research, right? And uh, when I, for instance, met Linda Amrel Zettler, or uh, came across her work, I emailed her immediately. And they're usually, scientists are usually very open, and they'll email you back, hopefully, and then you know you will have this kind of conversation. And um, does it help them? I don't know. This is like a big question. But um, this is very interesting. It's uh, changing now. Art, si art and science collaborations are becoming more and more prominent. And I was just like two weeks ago in a workshop uh, called Future Art and Emerging Technologies where they brought together like artists and scientists. And normally I'm used to being this artist who begs the PI, principal investigator, to work with me because there's no budget for us, right? I'm like, can I please come to the lab meetings? Like I love the work, blah, 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 to get my self into their lab, like through the chimney or something. I don't know, so I'm like always, working to kind of get into their work. But at this very workshop, the roles were reversed. There were six artists and like 12 labs. And it was a matchmaking workshop where six labs didn't get artists. And they were so sad and pissed. And I was like, yes, this, is, this feels great, you know. Now I'm the desirable one. And after the workshop, I mean, I found my match. But some of the scientists that I worked with, uh, talked with were emailing me, sending me links about their work. So maybe it'll change in the future. What are your other questions? <laughs> Hi, Pinar. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was uh, incredible. I have a question, I don't know, I have to think how to formulate this, but um, I'm interested in, in your um, personal story as an artist and the fact that you have so many degrees <laughs> and, yes. and so that somehow academia was uh, an important component of your, um, of forming your identity as an artist. And so my question is, how important it is to be part of a research environment such as university, for example, mm -hmm. for an artist like you, maybe versus this important residency also that you have done, um, and what is the main differences, or do you need both, in a sense? How do you see yourself moving forward? Wow. <laughs> um, I don't do you want the truth? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> well, um, well, I've always been a nerd, and I was always good at math and sciences, so I, I was always in school, basically. So uh, school was a good place for me, because you know, I was good at the school kind of stuff. So that's, I think, the number one reason why I started collecting degrees. But um, I have to say that, like, for instance, now I'm doing the dissertation. Like, of course, the academic research, it's a whole different level, and so whole different world with its own language and regulations and rules, etc. So it slows you down as an artist, right? Like at DMA, for instance, we're kind of on speed. There's like new things happening every day. You're learning a lot really fast because this is a place where we're actually practicing media arts. And um, there's the academic component, but UCLA is a great research university, so you can step out and like so this is a very like relaxed, nice environment in that sense. But it's not like this everywhere, 
right? So if you're publishing a paper, it has to be peer So there are all these other things that slow the artistic practice. And um, another thing is like, uh, art is happening at like multiple levels and you know, um, being in the academia too much might hinder certain opportunities, certain artists opportunities. So I have to say that. But uh, I love doing the research that I'm doing and like I'm so happy that I did this, you know, neuroscience degree at Duke. I am so happy that I came to DMA. I'm so happy that I, you know, did computer science and architecture <laughs> back in the day. Maybe not so much about architecture because it was painful. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's also, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. So it has its benefits and its challenges. Yeah. But uh, given the art science context, I do believe that it's important to know what the science is about. So I get upset when I see people who are like, oh, I'm so interested in science, or scientists who are like, oh, I'm so art interested in art, but they don't really want to like, you know, take the time to find out about what art is or what the science is. So that I'm like, no, no. But Everything else, I think it's also people's personal choices, like where you want to plant yourself and how you want to like nourish yourself. So, yeah. Amisha. <laughs> yes. Hey. Um, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm interested in. Uh, this about how you create animals that could exist maybe uh -huh. and maybe will exist in the future and it's something that I've also thought about a lot yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and I know I do this but do you I've never actually thought about designing the organs of those animals which is something that um, you sort of have to you don't see as much examples of new species yeah. organs when you hear about like yeah. the Cal Academy doing research and they're like, oh, we just took the Oceanus Explorer and we discovered like 16 new species and they're all weird and crazy and like floppy. Yeah. And um, are you, is, would the best thing in the world for you be for one of these animals to sort of be dissected and reveal a sort of digestive system that is resembling something that you've sculpted? And, and then my second question is um, in your, uh, in the future of you developing ecosystems, are you going to maybe develop ecosystems um, for extraterrestrial environments? Because that would also be kind of up the speculative alley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great questions. Uh, like fun questions. Thank you for fun questions. So, yes, I do. I do like to do small questions. That's why I brought it here. And I would love to see this guy make eggs. Yes, I do. And um, I mean, of course, there is this kind of like, you know, uh, criticality to it. And I want to like raise this questions about all of these things. But there is also, I think, uh, the fact that the, ch the notion of design is changing. And um, I think as a designer, like there was a phase for me where I was very drawn to computers and computing and algorithms and algorithmic design. and biomorphism that comes with it, et cetera, et cetera. And um, then I realized that, A, I'm not the best at it. There are people who are far better than doing that than me. B, I'm more drawn to like living things. And you know, although I studied chemistry earlier, I've always liked biology, et cetera. So when I think about this, I have a bottom-up approach. I'm like, how is this thing going to actually make that egg? So I have to really look into the organs and I really need to understand. It's also one thing why I wanted to study neuroscience because I was like, okay, how is this thing working? And then I'm like, okay, that's gonna take 20 years for me. To, or, you know, we, it's the most complex system in the known universe, so maybe slow down on that planar. But um, <laughs> organisms themselves, like right now, there is this, I mean, Media Lab, for instance, they, they're, I forgot the name of the new uh, director, Ito? Yeah, Joe Ito, for instance, he has this talk where he's like, bio is the new di digital. So there's this kind of like trend towards biotech. And we see a lot of organisms that are mostly variations on E. coli, right? But um, with techniques like CRISPR, et cetera, like it's, 
becoming like maybe more accessible or will become more accessible. And there's one person I love so much um, who wrote this essay called Our Biotech Future, uh, Freeman Dyson, and he claims that domesticated biotech, he coins the word domesticated biotech to begin with, and he claims that biotech will follow the path of personal computing and we ca will become more and more accessible uh, to children, grandparents, I don't know, he has this essay where he talks about like biotech in a, in a kitchen, right? So I like this stuff. I don't know what the uh, industry will force us because there are forces that we cannot control, but I would like to think of myself as an organism designer and when I think of myself as an organism designer, I would really like to think about what's inside the organism as well, or what makes the organism, right? About the, the, your second question, uh, I'm not that interested in outer space that much. I think we have a lot of interesting things on this planet that we're, you know, ignoring or that we're like forgetting about. So I'm more interested in designing ecosystems here on Earth. So, hi, Pinar. So, now, now that we talked about this kind of um, alternative chicken species and <laughs> things like that, so I'm just curious to hear what, uh, so what, what do you think about the trend in the sort of like biotech art where people actually use breeding of, of actual living organisms to, to create <coughs> artwork? I'm thinking about especially Cohen van Mechelen's The Cosmopolitan Chicken Project, where, yeah, where yeah. he's uh, starts actually breeding chicken through several generations and, and actually exhibits these chicken, living chicken, as his artwork. So w what is your take on that? So I, I, I think that you you are following a different path, but you sh surely must have some kind of a response to that kind of work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Can you also explain that title? Because I don't know it. Cohen van Chicken. Yeah. So, so he is a Belgium artist who's who's been, uh, <coughs> so he basically has a chicken farm, and uh, and he's making claims that his art uh, artwork, it's, he's an artist, he defines himself as a biotech, so artist. So he actually breeds chicken, and uh, and his goal is to sort of like come up with some kind of which he calls a universal chicken. So so breeding all different kinds of varieties of chicken uh, existing in the in around the globe, uh, through generation after generation, and he claims to have, I think it was over 10 years that he's been doing that all, 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 always. And so the, the artwork itself is not like a video documentation or whatever, but it is actual, those actual living chicken that he has been breeding through several generations, mm -hmm. through a certain kind of a system, a certain kind of a sort of like bio, 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 biotech philosophy almost that he's, he's developed. And and then he uh, gives all those these talks with uh, with very kind of like outrageous claims about like how the French anyway developed the typical French chicken uh, that that actually has the the, uh, the colors of the of the um, French flag already yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. like in a way Express, bred yeah. into the into the chicken species. Yeah, and so he wants to see what happens when he breeds all these different kinds of national and, and cul varieties from different continents and cultures, which for him reflect certain kind of cultural values already. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, you have to think about his work in the European context and how in Europe, like, like French and Belgian and Swiss and those nations that might, you know, be similar to us or all might blur in one group to us have strong identity. So he's kind of playing on that, of course, but I've uh, actually showed work next to him uh, at ZKM. When was it? This October. So I, show, I saw the whole thing and he had chicken in the exhibition hall, which gave the whole an interesting smell, I have to say. But, um, you know, it was a very nice installation with like these uh, pictures of all these, you know, nationalistic chicken heads and like there was a huge egg and like there was a live chicken and also this model of the farm he's building. So he's, I mean, he's Belgian. Belgian people love chocolate, but they also love chicken. So he has a lot of like supporters there. And you know, there, there's a larger context to his work. He's a cook, 
he has this institution, he's also like, you know, trying to breed other organisms, etc. But if you're asking about the idea of like um, an organism uh, or an artist making an organism and claiming that it's art, I mean, there's also like Eduardo Cax Edunia, for instance, right, where he mixed his DNA with a petunia and called it Edunia and he sells the seeds. And all right, you know, uh, expensive seeds and expresses maybe something about Eduardo. But so there's, there's already this thing going on. But I mean, there'll be a lot of new debates that will be, uh, will become a part of together with this like biotech revolution. And the design of the organism or who has the copyright or who has the signature will probably be one of them. So it doesn't surprise me that these people claim that they designed the organisms. Like, uh, again, I was showing Pool's Fall or Neolabia and somebody believed it was real. And after the talk came to me and they were like, where can we find this? And I was like, if I had my signature on a living organism, do you think I'd be giving this talk here? <laughs> so there is also this kind of, you know, um, financial corporate side to all of this. But um, it just doesn't surprise me. And it's it's a whole it's a fun project. He's a fun character. So yeah, um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but. Um, what are your last questions? <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe no more. Oh, wait. Um, I'm this, I don't mean for this to sound critical either, but I was curious. Like at what point do you think the materiality of your practice potentially contradicts the subtext or the message of kind of environmentalism or mm. um, I guess you could say like preservation? Or yeah. That's a great question. Um, I can't really put like a, you know, financial figure on it, actually. But for instance, um, the ecosystem of excess creatures um, are all made of plastic because it makes sense for them to be made out of plastic, right? But with um, salt water, we use plastic tubing. And I was just like, I have this other project where I'm like, you know, talking about plastic bottles and like ocean plastics. And I have to use PVC tubing here. But with every single project, I have a couple approaches. A, I don't work with huge budgets. So I really need to be very careful with the money that I, with the production money that I have. So for instance, uh, saltwater heart will be recycled. And it will be installed as an outdoor sculpture. And those pipes will serve, you know, for maybe a couple more years until they reach and break on their sun because that's what's going to happen to them. So there are always these questions. And I was thinking about, for instance, um, Jeff Koons' sculptures. Because again, when I was at DMA, uh, who took us there? Do you remember Chris? Yeah, Christian took us to Jeff Koons' uh, fabricators, uh, fabricators facilities. And they, there was this like uh, kind of shiny things and like a lot of masks, paint, a lot of industrial stuff going on, etc. So I was thinking about the toxicity of Jeff Koons' sculptures, actually, and whether th this, these sculptures are like um, uh, leaking out some stuff, right? So I hope, as an artist, not to get to that level or be very careful about like what I use, what I do, which kind of materials I use, basically. But um, I mean, I don't know, I can go on and on, because then you're also like starting to think about how you live your life and like, you know, every single thing you buy and are you a green consumer? Are you like, yeah, what are you? Who are you? So it's, it's, uh, it's not just uh, limited to the artistic practice, to be honest. Maybe you can introduce the idea to the community. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like chickens? <laughs> All right.